Edward Joseph, Johns Hopkins Science Farm Policy Institute. Uh, we want to welcome you all to this special, timely Farm Policy Institute event here with former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Zlako Logumcia. Zlako, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here today. And uh, we are in person here. Great to see everyone here in person again. Great to have these in-person events. And of course, we have many viewers online, in, including Ukuchiochi u Bosni, i pozdravljam sve prisutne ovdje i onaj koji nas gledaju na Zoomu. Okay, so uh, welcome to everyone online and in person here. We're, we're very pleased to have you. So um, those of you who, who follow and know Bazia know that there's, uh, it, the situation is not good. Uh, there's quite an intense uh, furor, really, over uh, some proposed changes to the election law that uh, were put out by the high representative. And that is simply among other long-standing crises that uh, beset the country. And uh, we are very pleased here today to have, I think, one of the best people to help us understand that. And that's what we're trying to do here today, to illuminate the issues that, that are at stake. Um, and that are, because Bosnia really, Bosnia-Herzegovina really is at a pivotal point. Now there either will or will not be some changes to the election law, and there will or will not be some other consequences that flow from that. So what I'm going to do, if you allow me, and Zlako, if you allow me, I'm going to introduce Zlako Lugunji to you. And I'm also going to, by way of introducing this event, tell a very brief story about how I first met Zlako Lugumjia, and that will open up our conversation. And uh, Zlako and I, we, we have a, 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 an array of issues to, to talk about that he would like to talk about. And uh, hopefully, if we have time, we'll, we'll get to some of your questions as well. But rest assured that we have a broad array of topics to, to talk about, and we really want to illuminate some of these uh, issues that are before us. So. Um, now, uh, of course, Zlako Lugumji is best known as the leader of the only non-nationalist government that post-war Bosnia-Herzegovina has known, the Alliance of Change, the Alliance for Change of 2001-2002. Um, and so he led that government there as chair of the uh, Council of Ministers or Prime Minister, and also as Foreign Minister. And he was also the longtime leader of the SDP, the Social Democratic Party from 1997 to 2014. And as such, as the leader of this party and that vision, there's a lot we can learn from Zlako about the realities of cross-ethnic cooperation in Bosnia-Herzegovina and the formidable challenges to achieving a civic state. Um, Zlako Lugunji was also foreign minister again in 2012 to 2015. He has a sophisticated grasp of geopolitics and understands where Bosnia-Herzegovina fits into that, especially today with the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, with the coming energy crisis, other issues Zlako would like to talk about. And finally, um, I should also mention this, also very important. Zlako was deputy prime minister in the very first government of the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina during the war from 1992 until he was badly wounded in Sarajevo in 1993. Um, and finally, uh, Zlako Lugunji has long been on the faculty of the University of Sarajevo as an expert in uh, strategic management of IT. And uh, that faculty experience is very helpful for us today because, again, the main aim is to try to understand these dynamics in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So Zlako, welcome. Um, uh, and Zlako, I just wanted to say you and I have something else in common. Uh, we were both uh, members of uh, or participated as as youth in high school in Youth for Understanding. Um, uh, Zlako here to the United States. I went to Mexico, and um, I I know that uh, there's a huge gulf in understanding we see today in Bosnia Herzegovina. So uh, let me quickly tell you this story, and then we're going to hear from uh, Zlatko. I'm going to uh, begin the questioning, and, and you'll hear from him in a second. But let me allow me just to quickly tell this tale when we first met. Um, I first heard the name Zlatko Lugunji when I was in Mostar. I'd been there during the war, and then after the war, I headed the OSCE office, 
obviously, of course, very deeply involved in election, leading the election effort in Mostar. And I had heard about this uh, incident in 1997. I was in Mostar when uh, Zlaka Lugumci had, on May, May Day, May 1st, had led a, a group SDP supporters to Birchka. This was the, the uh, issue, the, the town in the north um, that uh, was unresolved at the Dayton Agreement. And he went and, and he had a, a, an event in Birchko, and on the way back, he was attacked. He and his colleagues were attacked. Uh, Serb citizens there were very upset. They threw stones, they threw rocks. He was wound, injured in, in that. And the police, the RS police there really basically did nothing. And that's when I first heard about Zlako Lugumcia, even though we, we actually may have crossed paths uh, in, in Sarajevo and Mostar during the war. But, um, uh, and, when, and I then, shortly thereafter, uh, was transferred to Birchko, and uh, then in 1998, and I thought, you know, that's the wrong way for such an event to end, uh, to be uh, have rocks and stones when, when our whole purpose there is to uh, uh, bring peace. And so I reached out to Zlatko, and we organized a reprise of that event. But here's what was different. It wasn't only Zlatko Lugumci as head of the SDP in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I had reached out in Croatia to one of the prominent figures in the Croatian uh, SDP. Um, and that was Dravko Tomac, who later ran for president of Croatia. And in a symbolic meeting, Zlatko returned with his supporters on May Day, 1998. And so did Zdravko Tomac coming from Zagreb, crossing the bridge into Birchko. And we also had Social Democrat supporters from Banja Luka all meet. And it was this time a very peaceful event, no stone throwing. And uh, after that, uh, I just want to mention that uh, I worked closely there with all the Bosniak, Croats, and Serbs in, in that. Uh, in the run-up to the Bershko arbitration. And to say that the role, and Zlatko, you know this, the, the Croats role in Bershko was absolutely instrumental to the Bershko arbitration award. Croats were determined in post Savannah to return, recover their homes, return to their homes. And that played a crucial role in the arbitration decision and creation of the Bershko district, which is the most successful uh, part, really, of Bosnia-Herzegovina today. So I think that that very positive experience of Bosnia-Croat co collaboration, cooperation, uh, informs us as we confront this very bitter division, uh, Zlako, today. So I want to, uh, Zlako, open with that and, and memory that memory and ask you, again, with your background also, your wider background as prime minister and foreign minister, um, you see geopolitical developments there. Let's begin. Let's take a wider perspective. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has started six months ago, and still Serbia has not uh, put uh, sanctions on uh, Russia. Dodik, you still have these severe threats, uh, Russian backed threats of uh, secession. And the entire focus now in the country is on Croat Bosniak issues. So, this whole question of Russia, Serb collaboration, division of the country is obscured by these Croat Bosniak issues. Zlako, welcome and please, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Azad. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to, to our friends and a lot of people who registered to watch this online from different parts of the world. Oh yeah, and uh, I hope they heard, especially people who were not around, were not here. I just greeted people who are not in here. Uh, so that's the reason why I'm repeating it with a closer mic on my, to my mouth. Anyway, uh, thank you Edward, for, for this uh, introduction. I hardly recognize myself. I mean, you spoke so highly about what I was doing. So I forgot a lot of those things. Uh, I just, it reminded me of course that stones uh, in in Birchko. I remember I was uh, in a bus when we were driving through the city with rocks being thrown. And I remember there's a guy with a camera, like the cameras in here, who was uh, literally picking up the camera. We were laying on a on a on a in, in between the chairs in the bus. And he said, uh, and our language is kind of have a different meaning. He said, uh, Mr. Lagumji, I see you are hit in your head. 
because because I was actually hit by a stone in my head. But in our language, it says, I mean, I see people in here who are laughing, uh, because when you say you're hit in your head, it means that you're crazy, basically speaking. <laughs> so he said that you are hit in your head. I said, no, 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 I've been hit by a stone. But those people who stoned me, they are hit in the head. So, so that's, of course, uh, later on, I came back to, to, to Bryshko, as, as Edward said, and uh, uh, no one was hit in the head. Uh, people were really having a good time over there. A um, few years later, a year later maybe, there was a similar scenario. I tried to do actually to be rebuilding the country, part, be rebuilding the spirit of the country, which is united, which people with all the differences are people. People who are, basically speaking, uh, trying to work together, regardless of their different identities, either religious, ethnic, or political affiliation. So that was the major difference in between what I was proposing and what I was trying to do, and those stereotypes that are usually offered to us as a solution. You're supposed to have three tribal leaders. Uh, one is uh, chief of Croats, another one is chief of Bosniaks, third one is chief of Serbs. Of course, there's no chief of others who are not of any of those. So those three chiefs, if they get together, then we have no problems. So that's the matrix which I did not accept. And that's the matrix which I simply did not accept in Brčko. Later on, few, just a year later, uh, I was leading the same group of people in Srebrenica. We were opening SDP office in Srebrenica. And that was, I know people in here who are familiar with that. That was the time when it was said that we will not be able to bury people in Srebrenica who were killed there. And there was a plan to make a cemetery in Kladanj, which is in Federation. So uh, that we actually do not go back to Srebrenica even with the dead people. I personally opened the office of SDP over there with Bosniaks and Serbs at that time, just a few years after Srebrenica, who were trying to show that we can be Serbs and Bosniaks, we can be cross, we can be whatever we are. But at the same time, we want to go back to something which historically speaking, the country of Bosnia and Herzegovina was, which is today called shared society. Shared society and people with our differences are living together in dialogue, respecting each other, learning about each other, understanding each other. And that's what is basically called, in other words, human rights, right? It's uh, that we are talking about civic rights, about human rights, and not talking about, individu talking about individual rights, not about collective rights, because collective rights without individual rights being preserved actually are just manipulation for the thugs who want to use those collective identities and feelings in order, in the end, basically speaking, to run that separate group. That's what is the difference in between my future and my vision of Bosnia and Herzegovina and people who are, that's the reason why we are so, so thankful to our friends in the United States of America, because we think that you understand us much more than some Europeans, with all the respect to Europeans. I mean, they're also nice people. We are Europeans. I don't know, do you know that? But we're also Europeans. Uh, regardless of our ethnicity and our religion, we are also Europeans. But we have so much respect for the United States of America, not only because you actually stopped the war after genocide in Srebrenica, but basically speaking, because you brought us peace, chance to flourish in the future. And because we thought, and we still do think, that your understand us, who are Bosnians and Herzegovinians, regardless of our ethnic and religious background, what do we want to build? That's the reason why I know that we will speak, be speaking. I just wanted to, to say it in the very beginning. We'll talk about Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats. We'll talk about Bosniaks and Serbs and Croats, how they are combining against each other and plotting against each other, two against the third one, and so on and so on. But that's not my name of the game. That's not the name of the game that I want to be in, but for the clarification of the current situation, I will talk also about Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs being fighting, because the people who are today claiming that they lead Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats, they lead only small groups of people who actually are called politicians who are running mono-ethnic parties and misusing those, uh, those feelings for very, very clear gain. We'll talk about it later. Anyway. Uh, what I want to say is that, uh, Edward, just to, to make this parallel, geopolitical parallel with the Ukraine and what is happening, so we won't talk about Ukraine so much, but uh, Ukrainians are fighting together today 
the war for all of us. For all of us, regardless of where we are. They are fighting the war for us in Western Balkan and Bosnia as well. They are not doing that because of us. They're doing that because of themselves. But they're actually doing that also for us as well. Why I'm saying this? Because what we see today in Ukraine, what Putin is doing to Ukraine, is actually the same metrics and same mechanisms, same, same scenarios, and same uh, uh, even scripts, what Milosevic was doing back in 92, when he was actually trying to do to Bosnia and Herzegovina, what Putin is today trying to do to Ukraine. So uh, my point is very simple. Uh, maybe, maybe today the focus is on so-called Bosnia Croat issue. But I think that today people who are running the country, four leaders of the parties who are forming coalition, that is ruling coalition in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is Dodik, Jovic, Izetbegovic, and Komšić, those four guys, they have full capacity, full capacity to change any constitution, any law, and they have full capacity because they have two-thirds majority in all parliaments, in all governments, in presidency. And if they want to do something together, they can do it tomorrow. They can do it overnight. But they don't do it. Why they do it? Do it. Why they are always putting us back in this Serbs, Bosnians, Croats, citizens, others, call it however you want to, because that's the way that they just get reelected in October 2nd on elections. It's very, very simple. So today, we will be talking, of course, we'll be talking about this Schmidt initiative, this election law and all those things. But at the same time, I want to underline that while we are talking about this in my country, everyone, everyone who is running the country today is talking about election law, about fears, about potential conflicts, about threats, and actually trying to make people encapsulate in their or ethnic group or religious group or in so-called uh, citizens group with not being really citizen, but being also the people who will support certain policy, which is policy that today is driving this country in the wrong direction. We are not today, believe it or not, uh, two, two months before elections. I don't know how long we have, two months, less than two months. Is anyone talking today about economic crisis? Is anyone talking about energy crisis? Is anyone talking about healthcare crisis? Is anyone talking about educational crisis? Is anyone talking about the pensioner systems that is falling apart? In every country where those threats are today on the table, campaign will be about that. No, no one is talking about this. People who are running the country are not talking about it. And while we are talking about this, they are talking about how they will actually save their own ethnic group from others. And to make, to stop in here, I just want to give a fact, a few facts for this. In last elections, 2000 local elections, two years ago, or in previous elections, four years ago, those four parties, those four parties, I sometimes, Edward, just to, to make you, you know, start looking at me again, uh, I call them Dalton brothers, four of them. And the, the tallest one is not the smartest one and vice versa or whatever is, I, I don't know exactly. But those four guys actually who run the country, uh, their parties together got 32% of the votes. 32% of the votes, okay? Because of threshold and so on and so on. Having in mind that less than 40%, 50% of people participate in elections, all four of them together have 16% of the people who are eligible to vote. And they are claiming that they represent all ethnic group. They are claiming that they represent all Serbs, on Cross, all Bosics, and all citizens. So all four of them get one out of six people who are eligible to vote. That's about the legitimacy. And second fact, to be very precise, is I was... Uh, doing some, uh, some analysis of survey that was done by RCC, Regional Cooperation Council. They were doing survey on Western Balkan countries. And one very interesting question was uh, trust in institution, institutions. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, how much do you trust in judicial system, in courts and prosecutors and so on? Believe it or not, 26% of the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina trust the judicial system, 26 how many of you trust parliamentary, parliamentarians? 
25%. How many of you trust the governments of your country? 24% of the people. How many of you trust to the elected mayors in municipalities? 23%. How many people trust in political parties? 13%. I asked the people who were doing survey, why didn't you ask how much do you trust to organize mafia leaders? Uh, they said, why? Because I don't think that they will get that low bar. So 13% of the people trust to all parties, regardless of which one. So we are now talking about situation in which political parties are fishing for election votes, and they are using this, our debate and our topic that we'll be having today, actually not to sort out these issues, but to win the elections. And that's what is our problem today. Zalako, thank you. I understand that um, you know, we were chatting beforehand, and I showed you, um, I want to ask you about the, the, the tenor of, of this debate. And you, you did. You listed all of these concrete issues that are not being discussed. And, and one you could have added is this massive out-migration, uh, not just from Bosnia-Herzegovina, but from even also its neighbors. Uh, so an emptying of the country and, and those real and concrete issues that are not being addressed. Now, in terms of the concept here, I showed you, you know, just before we, we came on, an email that I got today, literally this morning, uh, from uh, someone who is a, a Croat, or in the, the words that were used today, to who self-affiliates as a Croat from Mostar, and uh, who has a passionate dislike of Dragan Čović, can't stand Dragan Čović, the uh, leader has n nothing but contempt for for the Hadeze leadership and and Dragan Čović, this leader who's become uh, the the so vilified in this question of the Schmidt proposal in these election laws. So this is a person who has nothing whatsoever, and yet supports the Schmidt proposals. In fact, doesn't even think that they're very strong. And uh, and I, I showed you that, and this it comes to this question, and it's like again, why you are really the best because you 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 the person to ask this because you tried and had that experience in 2001, 2002, trying to put together this non-nationalist uh, background. How to engage with that? The fact that. Um, Regardless of the of the noble aspiration of a civic state, that so many Croats here in this case, uh, opponents of Dragan Čović, simply are deeply skeptical of of that, and they and they and simply and and when you you talked about the balance of, of individual rights and group rights, um, are adamant that their group rights be respected and. Uh, and believe that they are not being respected. So, how to engage Zlatko instead of this, you know, tremendous acrimony? Uh, uh, how to engage with citizens, fellow citizens like this one, and 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 the ones I've spoken to who share this view, who are simply deeply skeptical about this concept, and again, actually support. The Schmidt proposals, and then we will come to the substance of the Schmidt proposals. Please. Well, we have only one problem. If we talk about the Schmidt proposal, probably Schmidt will say that Ironet never put the proposal on the table officially. So, basically speaking, that's the Schmidt proposal. I mean, everyone's talking about the Schmidt proposal, but he's the only one who says, I don't have a full proposal on the table. So, that's one thing. So, whatever I debate with, I happen to be debating with a ghost because uh, Schmidt is not saying that that's his proposal. Uh, you know how his proposal leaked out. Actually, he gave to the press, and it leaked out to the credible press. I mean, he never said that that's not what was his proposal. But but uh, his proposal, uh, Edward, then you know that very well, is basically speaking, uh, having three, four elements that were visible in a, in a, when I was talking, when I saw that, in the, in the media, 
that very afternoon, I remember. Uh, first, I checked with the guys who published it. I said, is it for real? I mean, are you, is this a fake news or is it invented? And they were credible journalists. They said, yes, that's what we got from credible sources. I was asking about who the sources are, but that's what, but at the same time, it was very interesting. And you know that, Edward, very well. Uh, from Dayton on, the devil is in details. Now I'm saying this because when I asked, I won't say the names, but I talk, I called immediately on the phone. I was going back to Sarajevo from, from being abroad and I was in a car. I was not driving, so I spoke with a, I called few people who were supposed to be actually knowing what that what this is about. They were either they were leaders of the political parties who were negotiating in Neum. They were heads of states and governments, ministers, whatever. Uh, I mean, the top people in opposition in the government. I spoke to them because I wanted to see what's going on. And uh, point number one, none of them saw proposal, okay? So proposal was not known to them. When I asked, what is, uh, when I asked two, three questions about what does it mean here, what is the consequence of that and so on, they had no clue. They were talking, I know the, another leader of the party who is not from my group, but who I have a good contact. I spoke to him and he was also speaking to Schmidt, but he doesn't know the answers to those questions. What I'm trying to say is, Edward, that basically speaking, that proposal is given, uh, let's say, just that we feel the water, how it is good. There was one thing, Probably. there was one, one, one thing that everyone gets grabbed for which is that famous people in the threshold of 3% threshold, which basically speaking, saying that if in one canton there is no 3% of the people of certain ethnic group, they, don't, they won't be represented in House of People, which is uh, questionable from a variety of perspectives. When you look at the structure of federation, when you look at 10 cantons, you can see that in five cantons out of 10, in five cantons out of 10, there is from 65 to 75 percent of the people of each ethnic group, Serbs, Bosnians, Croats, and others. So basically speaking, it means that you don't have to care at all about half of the country, because 75 percent, 60 plus, 65 to 75 percent of each ethnic group is represent is together in those five cantons. So you don't have to compete at all in overall country. You just compete at half of the country. And you can win everything over there. So that's one, one issue. Uh, second issue was uh, about lifting up this, uh, this uh, nomination process from that one third of members of ethnic group in caucus in House of People can propose the president, vice president of federations, which is basically speaking the trigger by which you are electing the government. So there is one third of minimum people who can choose. So generally speaking, what does he say? That you, you don't need 50% of the people that can nominate, that one third of the people can nominate. And then internally, in some kind of political negotiations, they see that in every constituent group, you can actually have chance to have two proposals. If you need, if you have to have half that can be nominating, that means that when you choose one, that's it. You don't have internal democratization, internal dynamics inside ethnic group. So why it was put from six? That was another. No one said that's that's going to be, but they tested it. But it's very interesting. None of the ethnic leaders. None one. Not Izetbegovic. Not Komšić. Not Čović. Dorik said, "I don't care. It's federation." None of them actually confronted that idea. Why? Because, because none of them is interested, no Chovic, no Izid Begovic, are interested that smaller parties can also be the players in, the, in it. That proposal itself, Edward, is actually supporting big mono-ethnic nationalistic parties. The biggest one takes all. Then there is no reason to have multi-ethnic parties being running because multi-ethnic party have to win in each ethnic group more than half of the percent in order to be a player. So basically speaking, you are creating a system in which you don't have one party system, but you will have three one party systems in a country. So instead of 
But those guys are very good. Most of them were very good communists, so they were very good in, you know, in between. We are not uh, representing the country on behalf of working class. We are representing the country because Muslims, Catholics, Orthodox, or Christians, Bosnians, Bosniaks, whatever. So Schmidt's proposal until today is not clear what it is. But what is interesting, what is interesting, three weeks ago, he gave a chance to leaders to make a deal. You know how many meetings they had so far? None. None. None of them wanted to do anything to try to make a deal. Why? Because this is election campaign for them. This is election. How many of them uh, came uh, make a tour or made a tour around European capitals or American or here? How many so-called Bosnian political forces? How many Bosniak representatives? How many Croat representatives toured around to talk to international community presence because international community is supposed to be imposing that. How many of them were around? None. You know why? They are not interested. And this is to be more precise because if you're talking about Bosnia and Croatia issue, uh, Chovic and Izetbegovic made so-called Mostar agreement some months ago, which was generally speaking, the fundament for future division of the Federation, okay? So Izetbegovic is not ready to say to his constituency that he's okay with this. They would like that high representative makes a decree in which he will strengthen mono-ethnic nationalistic parties. And that is the problem. What is happening with multi-ethnic political parties? They're not even close as strong as they used to be. And that's the problem we do have. So I understand that. And we're going to comment. Uh, I'm going to get to this, uh, that you opened up the substance of the uh, Schmidt proposal, and there are some complexities to it for those who don't, who aren't familiar. I'm gonna, we're going to come right back to that. But this is the, the point you just made, uh, Zlaka, I want to come back to you. You said that, uh, why haven't they toured outside Bosnia-Herzegovina? My question is, why haven't uh, figures toured political leaders and leaders of civil society toured their own country? This is, uh, as someone who's who's worked there you know, during the war, after the war, this is what's so troubling. This complete breakdown in dialogue and complete vilification of the other side. That's my, the, the concern here. And again, I refer to messages like that of this morning. People who have nothing, nothing whatsoever for this uh, uh, vilified leader of the of the main crowd party, the Hadeze Dragon, they have nothing for him. But they they uh, adamantly oppose the concept of the civic state and believe in preservation of group rights, whatever one thinks of that. And my my question is like, oh, is where is the engagement around the country? Where where is the the engage the dialogue with people like that to say, tell me, what are your concerns? What what are you concerned about? Are you and now are you aware of our concerns? Instead. Uh, and again, this is why the first question I asked was about Serbia and Russia and Dodik and the Republic of Srpska, because as long as there is this mutual demonization, uh, then there's no discussion whatsoever about Dodik, R Russians, Republic of Srpska, and the real division of the country. That's that, that's my uh, questions, Michael. There's what about some engagement on the concerns, the concerns that you saw. In, in that message of Croats, I'm sorry, who, who, who simply uh, do not believe in, in a civic state without protection of group rights. And, and again, and I, I know the dollar, the, the response to this is, oh, Croats are overrepresented. But if, if, if there's no space for engagement here, and, and I understand politicians maybe, you know, it's a pre-election environment, everyone's afraid to be not called a, a patriot. But as a leader, uh, someone who tried to to this, wh where is the, what avenues are there to engage uh, constructively uh, on these issues? I don't think that, as I as I said, that uh, Quartet, Dalton Brothers, they're not interested in. They're not. Debate. They're not interested. So yes. the question is, who would actually be the ones who is debating 
in 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 political arena in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's the real yes. question. Where are the civil society exactly. people? Exactly. Exactly. That's I'm, that's. I'm sorry. I'm, yes. I, I I agree with you. Yes. I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do as much as I can. I understand. But of course. But you're right because uh, it looks like uh, the those political leaders, those four guys yes. who actually run the yes. country, they hijacked the debate about it because all debate is about. Uh, Schmidt going to do X, Y, or Z in situation where Schmidt doesn't say which is ABC, so why he would do about X, Y, Z. So, so that's one thing. Second thing, what which I think is uh, it's it's very important is that um, you see, Edward, uh, today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we do not have substantial public debate about real issues. That's what I said. Uh, you know, everyone knows that winter is going to be tough. It's so logical. It would be so normal that we ask people who are running in elections, what is your, how you, we are going to survive the winter? What will happen with inflation that is skyrocketing? That would be logical. But no, we are all in a game about 2 3% crowds here, 6 8 Bosniaks that way, and so on and so on. We are all in that game because the political arena is dominated by those issues because the guys who want to actually run the country, to keep the country running the way it is, they actually gave us a decoy, so we discuss about it. And let's be very sure. clear. Let me be very clear. Dodik is absolutely trying to destroy the country. There are no doubts about it. Let's, be, let's talk about, I mean, so he's interested. He's interested to destroy the country. Dodik is not only bigger size-wise than Putin, but he's bigger Putin than Putin, because sometimes he wants more to be, you know, pro-Russian than Putin is. Sometimes Putin sometimes tried to be, you know, like cool guy, and 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 Dodik doesn't try to be cool guy. I mean, he just said boop boop boop. That's it, and most of that is really boop boop in any language. So so uh, there is no doubt that that guy wants to destroy the country, and he's publicly saying, look, he was in Israel a uh, month ago, two months ago. He said that. We Serbs have to fight against Bosniaks like Israel fights against terrorists. I mean, does it make sense? Of course it doesn't make sense. But I mean, the guy is brutally openly, openly taking a hammer in his hand and saying, I want to destroy this country. Chovic is much more clever, much more clever. But let's be very precise. Chovic's goal is the same one. He wants his piece of the territory. He wants his piece of territory that he controls. People who are familiar with it, they call it third entity. He wants third entity, not officially, not publicly. And when I'm against third entity, I'm saying I'm not against third entity. I'm asking you, why third? Why it is not second entity? Why third entity? The way second. Okay? One is Republika Srpska, so he's creating third entity. He's missing entity. Sec I'm against second entity. Second entity is intended for Bosniaks. So we'll have people in Sarajevo, Tuzla, Zenica region, and we'll have Bosniaks up there in uh, Unasana Canton. For ones who don't know geography, it's like Western Bank and Gaza, okay? There is no corridor in between. So actually the third entity, the concept of third entity, is actually the concept of dividing the country along ethnic lines. And that's what Schmidt's proposal is. He's cementing and proposing that people who are minority in some parts of the country, they should see how they should, as one diplomat said, I'm, it's not our fault that some people are wrongly parked. I said, what do you mean wrongly parked? It means that you are minority in some part of the country, so you're wrongly parked. You get ticket to vote, but you go to some place where you will be rightly parked. So the overall concept of, of this uh, at, uh, that uh, election uh, election law changes is intended the way I see it. I, I won't I won't say that it is because Schmidt doesn't say what it is, but it looks like that a lot of people be be wrongly parked, and we will end in process of defining three territories in a country, in which you have to win not among the people of the country but among your ethnic group. I don't know how to make it more clear. 
You have to, you have a uh, African American, not in Bosnia, but maybe we also have with this migrant crisis, we are going to have also this African Americans in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well. You have that that group. You win amongst them, and that's it. In federation, let me ever to be very clear for you who don't know, in federation there is according to last census 1.5 hundred. 50,000 Bosniaks, 1.5 million, okay? There's about 495 Croats, half million. There's about 50,000, 50,000 Serbs, and about 100,000 people who do not declare themselves as any of them, okay? So the consequence of the model that was, I won't say Schmidt proposal, but the proposal that is floating around, no one is father, there's no mother, it's, it's there. It's a ghost, okay? According to that, you have to win. And that's what ba why Bakir is not complaining. Because if he complains publicly, his constituency is going to tell him that he betrayed the country, that he's dividing the country like Dodik and Chovic. And he's not going to say that because he will be politically dead, because Bosniaks are not interested in dividing the country, okay? So you have to win among 1.5 million Bosniaks in federation and no one can. You have to win among 500,000 Croats, and you have to win. And no one is talking about Serb issue in federation, because 50,000 Serbs are going to have whoever wins among 50,000 Serbs, who wins 30,000 votes among more than 2 million people, he will be or she will be unavoidable. Are we going now, instead of having Federation blocked in between, as you say, Serbs, uh, I'm sorry, Bosniaks and Croats, we will have Federation being divided in between Dodik, Chovic, and Izetbegovic. And we will have, instead of two, we will have three ethnic chiefs who will be actually making decision who is going to make a government over there. So that's the reason why I expect here, I expect, and that's, I'm, let me put it this way. In Bundestag, there was unanimous declaration by Bundestag about promotion of Bosnia and Herzegovina as multi-ethnic, civil society, civic state, shared society, call however you want to. Bipartisan, I'm sorry, tripartisan or quadripartisan, or all parties, and Greens and, and Semaphore Coalition, Green, Red, Yellow, and Black, Democrats. They were all having only communists, German communists, they were kind of having some problems, but probably I understand why. Now, they were all talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina as multi-ethnic and civil society. How come? How come that it is seen that you guys in here are not so vocal for defending it? How come that it is seen that uh, our ultimate, ultimate line of defense is not sticking to the same principles that you stick from the very beginning. Let me, let me address that. Oh, give me that, please. Yeah, I will. Okay, Zaka, that, that's going to be my uh, role here to try to draw you out on this. And let me, those of you who don't follow the, 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 the details, uh, and it can be forgiven, and believe me, those who do, it's, it's difficult. Let me, let me just try in the most concise way I can to uh, bring people in to, to what's happened here. So what I, I would start with is that you had uh, two figures, leading figures in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina from the international community, the former U.S. ambassador, Eric Nelson, and Johan Sattler, who's the head of the EU, they, they made a pronouncement that there are three pillars of reform. There's, there's uh, nominally Bosnia is on, uh, has a, uh, a pathway to EU membership. There's these 14 conditions, and, and they uh, noted these three pillars of reform, uh, and uh, which were this long-standing uh, case of uh, the European Court of Human Rights, the, the Sadich Finci and Zornich cases, uh, th that's about having people who are not members of, of the three constituent groups being able to, to run for uh, president, um, election integrity, and they also mentioned the third pillar was constitutional court decision. Now, there have been a number but the one that they presumably had in mind is this case called the Lubitsch case. And uh, that case uh, addresses a complaint from a uh, Croat about the way elections 
are, are, were held and that uh, challenged the, the existing regime and that said this has to be changed. Uh, this must be changed along a, a, a method. This is not constitutional. That's what this court held. And uh, these, the, the former U.S. ambassador and uh, Sattler, the EU rep, said, yeah, these are these are the three elements. And that was, as you know, Zlatko, that was the subject of this long, these long negotiations that failed some months ago. Now, why did why did this um, high representative uh, late last month in July, when those talks those talks broke down way back in February March? So why did he suddenly jump in uh, here in late July and impose, say, say, uh, you know, leak this? And by the way, he has never denied that that these uh, proposals are out. Uh, Schmidt has never said no, 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 no. Uh, that's just rumors or something. He's essentially acknowledged and and that 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 this exists. And he even in this, you know, uh, contentious press conference uh, also sort of acknowledged that and acknowledged that he's given. As you said, six weeks to to uh, uh, the parties to discuss and come up with with solutions. But um, the the point is that the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, saw a problem. Now, you, it, it may be that no problem exists, but they detected a problem, and the problem that they saw was that these elections. Um, could or maybe even would, in their estimation, lead to a situation where, uh, within the Krat Caucus, the um, there would be Bosniak votes, that is, votes from those who, who are representing parties that don't purport to represent Croat interests, would it would attain this threshold? Would effectively, would deny Croats the ability. Um, to veto, which is the purpose of this, this ethnic protection that, with, that goes to constituent peoples, that that's part of the foundation of the Dayton Agreement. And this is the, what they were concerned about, rightly or wrongly. Uh, that's, that was their animating concern. It wasn't to, uh, okay, how can we go around and, and solidify ethnic division in the country? It was That was the animating fear, as they have explained to me. Um, now, it may be that this proposal is a very bad way to address this, but the animating factor was this concern and the need to implement this constitutional court decision, uh, this Lubitsch case. And that involves uh, proportional representation, involves the question of, of whether uh, and how you allocate seats uh, by some geographic or non-geographic uh, uh, um, uh, approach, and there are perceived imbalances. This is the word that uh, Schmidt has used himself, that there are these imbalances where from some canton in eastern uh, Bosnia, where there are hardly any Croats, gets the same representative of another canton where there are loads of Croats. So this is th these are the issues, the, the nature the, of, of whether this is fair and proportional representation. Now, uh, obviously, it's a huge debate, and it goes to the question of the Dayton Agreement. It goes, as you've read, the, the question of constituent peoples. Should there be such a concept? But they're confronted with the fact that that's the agreement as it stands. And to change it requires, uh, again, the, the agreement in, in some form, some type of consent. So um, my question, I, I do that by way of explaining to, to our audience here and those watching uh, the background and animation of this. Now, you you challenged, in particular, this uh, raising of this threshold uh, within this uh, each of these three caucuses, from six to eight, to form uh, uh, to form to nominate the government. And and you you've uh, said that this is uh, terrible. This will consolidate. Now I will give you the answer that the proponents of this give. I'll just share with you. I know it's uh, not yours. Yes, I'll give you the answer. Um, is that if uh, if it's not possible for uh, Bosniaks, let's say, to attain six now, uh, you know, in other words, to to penetrate into the House of Peoples and and uh, and get uh, votes that don't by uh, by parties that don't purport to to represent Croat interests, um, and to deny that veto, if you say that. It's not possible for them that this was a wrong uh, basis. There's no worry 
about attaining six. Their argument is, well, then why are you worried about eight? If, if, if it's not possible to get to six, then who cares about eight? They're both on it. If they're both unattainable uh, levels that, you know, in other words, there's no threat here of some type of subversion of the intent of the House of Peoples, which is meant to protect group rights, um, then why is the worry about uh, raising that? That's that's one. And the other point that then let me just throw give you the, these responses. The other point is they say, well, if this is all to the benefit of this major Croat party, the Hadeze, that's what the Hadeze and Dragančović, this you know uh, figure vilified, and again by by many by Croats I showed you who also have no, then why do the other Croat parties? also support these changes. They should be the first ones to agree with you. They should be the opposition to the Hadas. They should be the first one to agree with you and say, yes, this is giving our opponent, Dragan Chovic, a, a big advantage, and we don't want that. And instead, they're saying the opposite. There's, uh, from what I detect, they're saying, we support the Schmidt proposals. In fact, we don't think they go far enough. So that, let me, that's, this is how, the, the what you would hear if you present this your your point. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. You are talking about for the ones who don't know Ljubic case is one of the court's verdicts about uh, this issue. But uh, it's interesting uh, that people are sometimes uh, trying to get their point by seeing as Bosnian political dynamics as a Swedish table. We call it. You know, you go over there and you pick up what you want. And then you don't care about other things. Uh, Ljubic uh, verdict is, I think, uh, fourth or fifth that is pending uh, in this in this issue. The first one is uh, called Sejdic Finci. Then there is Zornic case, there's Pilav case, and so on and so on. There are a lot of, a lot of those. And everything started. And this, uh, Chovic actually realized that and he's clever. I, 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 look, I, I have to admit, I mean, he's playing a uh, really very intelligent game. The question is, who is he playing with? So I, I think that uh, I, I never voted for him. I mean, and definitely we are not the same same political philosophy. But I mean, I have to admit the guy is very intelligent. I mean, everything starts with this called so-called Sejdic Finci. Uh, you know, uh, there is 100,000 people who are in Federation, two times more than Serbs in Federation, who will have, according to this uh, non-existing Schmidt proposal, uh, who will have uh, uh, same rights and mechanisms to block the things like million and five hundred or five hundred Bosniaks and Croats, but hundred thousand uh, non-Bosniak, non-Serb, non-Croat non people are uh, people who are discriminated according to the verdict of Bosnian Constitutional Court and according to European Court in Strasbourg. European Court for Human Rights, because just to remind you, everything started with appeal of uh, Jewish and Roma representatives who were appealing to all instances of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they got, uh, let's say, verdict in their favor, but political structures didn't do anything about it. So they appealed to Strasbourg, to, to, to court of, for, uh, for European Courts of Human Rights and Freedoms. Why? Because our constitution, thanks to you guys, it's kind of crazy. I mean, that Americans in Dayton, they built in our constitution, one article says that European Convention of Human Rights and Freedoms directly implies is above all laws, and it is integral part of this constitution. We are the only country, of course, we are the only country that has a, that Dayton, Dayton constitution. I mean, and, and uh, <laughs> I, I hope you will never have the Dayton constitution here in America, because you will really be in a deep deep waters, we, uh, okay? We, we, we uh, have a uh, right to bear arms oh, yeah, and that's, other that, things, that, so. that's okay, I mean, that's okay. I mean, I'm not implying, I, I mean, I, I can. I said to the Swiss, my Swiss friends, I mean, you guys, because they, when they were dealing with some constitutional uh, help, support to us, I said, look guys, if you, in Dayton, you got as an extra one constitution for Switzerland, because you have also cantons like we do and all these things. If you would get in Switzerland, a constitution like us in Dayton got, probably Switzerland would fall apart three times in the last 25 years. I mean, because it's so non-functioning thing. But anyway, part of that constitution is a great one that says that the European Convention of Human Rights and Freedoms is integral part of our constitution. When Sejdic Finci appealed, the verdict was that yes, 
the European Convention of Human Rights and Freedoms is violated because him, two of them, as a non-Bosniak, non-Serb, non-Croat, they cannot run for the presidency because they are they're not only parked, there's no parking place for them at all because they are simply, they don't fit in BH, uh, Bosnian, Croat, Serb uh, matrix from Dayton. So for, I don't know, 15 years, we've been trying to sort out Sedic Finci. There is no political will. Why? Because in order to change it, you need two thirds majority in both houses and half of majority in each ethnic group. And nationalists are not interested in sorting out Sedic Finci because that's against their reason for existence. And that's why we are stuck with it. And then, then when we start talking about Sedic Finci, then Chovic brought in the issue of Lubic verdict. So my point is, let's do step by step. We are not dancing school, but we should do the things that are violating everything, violating our constitution, violating European Convention of Human Rights and Freedoms, and so on. So you cannot pick up, uh, by the way, uh, Lubic uh, case is uh, very controversial about some people are saying that some things from his court verdict are sorted out already because he complained about issues that we won't go in details, but some issues were already sorted out with the election commission and so on. That's one thing. And second thing, I'm not talking about, you see how we are flipping from one point to another. Everything started with Komšić is not legitimate. Everything started with that. Suddenly, you have to change federation constitution to jump from six to eight, because who cares? If it's two thirds, if they can get two thirds, so why are you complaining about they having half? as a minimum, to have a government. So don't be, we are talking about Komšić case. Everything started with it, started with Sedin Švinci, and we came in a completely different arena where you are trying with Schmidt, hopefully not, but one ghost, one of his goats that is floating around, is saying that he will lift from six to eight minimum in order to elect a federation government. So how come that came all at once out of Sedin Švinci, out of those other things? By the way, when Komšić was elected first time, Chovic didn't complain about it. Because at that time, I was president of SDP. We were a second biggest crowd party, okay? And we were not, he was elected, we had a strong, strong uh, representative of Croats in House of People in different parts where HDZ is majority, where HDZ is winner. But we won there as well. Second question is, why? Why Croats in Sarajevo and Tuzla, for example? Croats in Sarajevo and Tuzla, who are real Croats. How come did they have no their vote? And by the way, if, if the protecting vital ethnic interests is about people who are someplace suppressed, then who has better feeling that he or she is suppressed when he's minority or he's majority in certain parts of the country? So if you are, if I'm, let's say, for example, I think that Bosniaks who are in, in Herzegovina, where HDZ majority, they have more right to say what is vital interest of ethnic group because they, as a minority, then can be jeopardized, as well as Croats who are in Sarajevo or Serbs who are in Sarajevo, they, when they are, mathematically speaking, minority. Of course, they should be represented in a place where you are defending ethnic interests. So what Chovic is doing with this Ljubic uh, twist, he's trying to say that actually where Croats are majority, they will decide what is ethnic interest of Croats. Where Bosniaks are majority, they will decide it. That's actually the introduction to something which is much worse than, than with it. And to be very precise, Edward, and you know that very well. I was participating in the meetings. I was when they put that issue on the table. You know what was their proposal? Serious proposal. Serious. Pro I'm not, I'm I'm saying this very clearly. They proposed, they said that the only way to have clear cut that we have three or maybe four, it's necessary, but three ethnically defined list of voters. That Bosniaks, you have to register as Bosniak voter. You have to register as Croat voter, you have to register as Serb voter. And then you can vote for only people who are of same ethnicity that you are. This is, when they put it on the table, I thought, I'm very glad they put it in front of some international representatives who are even placed in this country. They were saying that, you know, so what is the problem? Of course, the problem is that you're asking me what is the problem. That's the problem. So Komšić is, I voted for him twice. He's th three times elected in, in presidency. I voted for him twice. Because first and second time when he was elected in, there were a significant portion of Croat votes behind him as well. 
which is not the case today. And I understand that. I understand that. But from legitimate problem point of view, from point of our constitution, Dayton constitution, he's legally member of the presidency because in constitution it is said very clearly you have to be elected by people of federation and Bosniaks and Croats and Serbs and others can vote for any one of them. I'll give you an example. Today, Croats can decide who is going to get into seats of presidency on behalf of Bosniaks. They can do that. We all know that. Because whoever wins Bosniak seat in the presidency, he will have less votes than Croats votes are on the table. So, so that type of manipulation is always possible. But my question is very simple. How come that until two, three months ago, everyone was talking about Komšić's case, even Čović, let, let, let me... and, then, and then suddenly Komšić is there as a scarecrow, and they're putting finger in him. But at the same time, now they're flipping to completely different federation, functioning federation to make federation divided by two on so-called non-existing ghost proposal by the ghost called High Red. Uh, Zlatko, I understand all that. Let me quickly say again, uh, fulfilling my role here to, you know, to to advance dialogue and the conversation. Let me say what officials would say, what Western officials would say. Why uh, this uh, Sadich Finci is not dealt with, and what happened to you know Komšić and all of that. Um, they would say that. The reason for these Schmidt proposals is for implementation of election results, to avoid a crisis of implementation of the results that they believe, rightly or wrongly, uh, according to their prognostication, could result in this uh, development where the uh, effectively the, 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 uh, the blocking mechanisms of the House of Peoples would be removed from Croats. That's that, okay, rightly or wrongly. That's what they say. So that's was the animating, that's what drove, so they tell me, this is what drove the timing, this July timing of Schmidt to act, and and yes, the Lubitsch. Now, um, Swedish table, choosing Lubitsch, not choosing Sedich Finci. The other, this is the counter to that, is number one, uh, Schmidt, a high representative, cannot, I'm told, uh, change the Dayton Constitution. He can deal with the federal constitution, but not the Dayton Constitution. And they haven't, uh, obviously, the negotiations that were foolishly uh, didn't address that and didn't have these long things and, and sort of left the Serbs out of the whole discussion. But the other point is, as you know this, is like, oh, there's many ways to, uh, to implement Sadich Finci, including one from one of the plaintiffs that involves none of this rigmarole. There's one, there's a very simple one that says, Anyone can run for president, but uh, not uh, you can. Uh, whoever there cannot be two members of the same group. That's from one of the plaintiffs in in one of those cases. So you can do this without uh, completely you know, altering. There's there's many many ways, and they've been discussed and and, and proposed. Now you you raised Jelko uh, Komšić in this case. For those of you who don't know, there are three members of the uh, under the Dayton Agreement. Three members of the presidency. One is representing Croat, one Bosniak, and one uh, Serb. And the, the, uh, Zlatko is correct that the, the, feder the ones from the Bosniak Croat are elected from the Federation. So technically, it's, uh, it's allowed. But Zlatko, you said Croats can, can elect the Bosniak, but they're much smaller in number. So their votes, if Croat votes go, you, they can, you can only vote once. So if 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 Croat votes, uh, Bosniaks have the ability by simply by demography. I mean, this is this is the fact. By being larger in number, can can afford some can afford to to cast their ballots for Jelko Komšić, and uh, and others can can choose between uh, whoever is the Bosniak candidate. Uh, this is you you come to the, the, the one of the central issues for Croats as the smallest group in the country feeling the most requirement for group rights. So that it's not a reciprocal. It's not, uh, uh, it, it would be different if it were reciprocal. If, if there was some way to, to counterweight the votes that each could do that, then, then it, it, perhaps. But that's, uh, I'm, again, I'm just sharing that. But let me ask you this straight up uh, because we have a question uh, that came in from uh, our viewers here about Jelko Komšić. So does Jelko Komšić fulfill 
the constitutional responsibility of a representation of Croat interests. Does he fulfill that uh, role? Are, are Croats, in fact, represented at the level of the presidency through the election of Jelko Komšić? What do you say? As I, to as I told you, um, constitution is very clear. It's very clear. And he's elected according to the constitution, and he's elected last time with the majority of Bosnian votes, there are no doubts about it. But our constitution says that, basically speaking, the only way to overcome that problem, you have to make ethnic ballot, ethnic lists for the voters. That's the only way to do it. Now, when I said that Croats can elect Bosniak members of the presidency, everyone understands that this time, member of the presidency from Bosniak seat, whoever wins, there will be very small margin. Last time, margin was about 20,000 votes in the last elections, just four years ago. Uh, now it will be a very close race. No one really can predict for sure who is going to win because it will be a close race. So uh, we have half a million Croats in Federation, according to the last census. So just a small portion of them can uh, be the one who is deciding who is going to be elected over there. In Republika mm -hmm. Srpska, we have the same thing. Uh, Bosniaks can very clearly define who is going to be the president of member of the presidency from Republika Srpska, because Bosniaks in Republika Srpska, as well as Croats in Republika Srpska, they have only choice in between Serb candidate. So uh, everyone knows that when Ivanic lost, when Ivanic won against Dorik or Radmanovic or whoever, every time the winner was the one who was decided because of the result of non-Serb votes. So it's that's what Dayton is about. So don't give me, I mean, that that mathematics, how can be mathematically speaking? As I said, I do not support policy of Mr. Komšić, very clearly. And I think that he's best player of Mr. for Mr. Čović to make a scarecrow. And he's asking actually to get another concessions, which have nothing to do with the election of the president of the presidency. Because Čović would, believe it or not, we have something like, which is called the director of indirect taxing authority, which is actually the czar for taxes, okay? That that thing is more important to Chovich than the seat in the presidency. So he would never, and he is controlling everything from the top to the bottom in financial sector and, 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 and legislative to ministers of justice on levels and so on and so on and so on, which is okay. But I mean, what I'm trying to say, he very clearly and eloquently misused this uh, Komšić case. At the same time, I'll give another example. And you know that, Edward, for, I'll give you an example. There is a very, very small, beautiful municipality called Vares which is close to Sarajevo, where Bosniaks are majority. There is much more Bosniaks than Croats. For two terms in a row, the mayor of Vares, who I admire very much, he has nothing to do with me politically. He's a very proud member of HDZ, Ochovic party, OK? And he just killed all his opponents. Uh, he won two times landslide victory in Vares. They are less Croats than Bosniaks. So no one is complaining, and I'm not complaining, that he beat bad Bosniak candidates. He won because he was good for the people of that municipality. And he literally beat it two times in a row, uh, Bosniak candidate. So what is the problem with it? How come that no one is complaining about wrong ethnicity of Vares mayor? I'm just giving you an example. So, and by the way, you see, for calculation six can be achieved. No, you said for yes or no. The question is no, it cannot be. I can bet in here, I'm giving you a public offer to bet. There will be no six Sarajevo party seats in Croat caucus. Everyone who reads the lists of ballots know that neither SDA, neither SDP, neither DF actually were putting the candidates that are prominent Croats who can win. Only, and I have to be sure, I will, for the correctness, I think that biggest misusage that Bosniak dominated parties did in Gorazde, because it's not fair. The thing Goraj, the electing guy who is definitely not Croat. By the way, by last instance, 24 Croats were registered over there. And it's not fair. It's not fair to actually nominate someone who is obviously not Croat with name and surname and everything. And then in order to get the Croat seat, but it's one, okay? And in Unasana Canton, it can be the one. I, I can also have a, I know that what will be your answer, but because I like your answer. Uh, there's a guy called Fikret Abdic. He's definitely Bosniak. Uh, you know, the guy who was actually in a war plotting together with Tujman and Milosevic against Bosnian army. 
and he's Bosniak, by the way. His daughter, she's elected as a Croat. And Trovic likes her very much because she always votes with him. So she, he's not, she's not the problem. Now, there will be one Croat from Sarajevo, one Croat from Tuzla. I know Trovic has a problem with it. But Croats from Sarajevo and from Tuzla that are going to be elected over there are not from HDZ. And they know very well how it is to feel someplace as a Croat that you are not member of majority of ethnic group. So two more, there's no way. Simply, Chovic knows that very well, that he, and he said Begovic knows it, Komšić knows it, Nikšić knows it, all these guys. They know that they cannot hit four out of six. But Chovic wants to be sure because this is the way that he marginalized the smaller crowd parties. Why they are not complaining? Because he uses Komšić case and this Goraš de Bosniak, who claims to be a Croat, as his argument to shut down those Croat voices of the smaller Croat parties. And I am strongly against the fact that you make an election system in which, by default, on 100 meters relay, major mono-ethnic nationalistic parties among Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks are already on 60 or 70, 70 meters away from you, and then you have to try to catch them up to the end of 100 meters relay. That's not what is okay. And that's what I hope that it's not going to happen. Zalako, thank you uh, for that. Um, I'm going to open it up here. We'll, we'll get some uh, questions from the audience in the remaining time. But I, I've got to ask you that this pivot from that to the obvious, the obvious question, which is what should Schmidt do? What take take the position to be take the role uh, of the high representative? What should he do? Should he do nothing? Let just let this election play out, um, or uh, should he make some changes to the election? He already did these uh, so-called um, integrity changes, and by the way, there's some uh, uh, I've gotten objections even to those uh, changes. But should he do nothing? Uh, should he make some uh, minor changes? How to address what these uh, Lubitsch, uh, whether you like it or not, the, these, the, the, the decision in there about what constitutes uh, adequate representation uh, there. That's, the, that's basically the issue in the, the constitutional court addressed. Do nothing, just simply let it go, and then talk about it in the post-election framework. What, what, what do you say? First, I think that the technical, technical changes that he made, he could make it a long time ago. And they are still far away from what he could do it. I'll give you just an example. Uh, elections are, I won't go into details, but if you would have scanners and cameras on election lists, on election places, it would significantly change the result of elections, okay? To make it very clear. So he could do it much, much easier and earlier, and he didn't do it. The question is why. I don't know why, but he could do it. He still can do some things. He still can do some. But what he could also do, what he could also do, Edward, is he should make these changes that he was intending to before elections were called. Because now we have elections in which you have no clue how the... Uh, <laughs> how the elections will be calculated. I mean, it's, it's completely crazy. Now we have lists, we have, uh, everyone is defined. You have candidates, you have everything. And suddenly someone says, okay, I'll change the rules. You know, we are, you know, you, you, you go to the Super Bowl and someone says, okay, but how about, you know, we do some baseball rules? Okay, why don't we do that? It would be fun, it would be fun. So you can catch the ball only with this glove. You know, you can't, it's Super Bowl, yeah, okay, no, 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 let's try it with baseball. It's our favorite game as well. So you, you don't do that. You don't do that to the voters, to people who pay the ticket to watch Super Bowl, okay? So you don't do change the rules of the game when the game was already going on. And especially because he's changing, I'm, I'm referring especially to the rule six to eight. Six to eight is strategically changing the nature not of these elections, because it will be not needed for this election, but it is opening the route for Chovic, Izetbegovic, and Dodik to run federation for decades and make civic societies, civic state parties being marginalized and making people, people looking how to repark themselves in different parts of the world, of the country. 
No, I, I wasn't. I, I didn't make a mistake. Yes, in different parts of the world. Because most of those people are waiting these elections to just pack and go. Okay? And that's the problem. And this is the message for people who are interested in their own country to be country that is multi-ethnic, European country, and to be very precise, Edward, we talked about it. If two million, I'll put that card on the table as well. If two million out of four million Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims, are interested in living in one European Union as being part of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, being part of European Union and NATO, if they are interested to be citizens of Europe, where 500 million of citizens are not their religious and their ethnicity. If 2 million of them want to live in European Union and in NATO, why? Why? They cannot be living in one country where they are simply 50% of overall citizens. Why? Why? That's the question we have to. And by putting this on the table, I want to say that we are playing in a card which is a very dangerous card, which Bosnian Muslims are going to feel betrayed by European Union, by Americans, by NATO and EU. And no wonder, no wonder that Russian ambassador was the one who 20 days ago said, oh, oh, poor Muslims. You know, we are on your side. This Europeans, Americans, they are obviously against you. You know how Muslims are living so nicely in Russia. We have mosques with four minarets over there. We have our dear friend Kadyrov who loves us so much. We would love you as well. I mean, is that, is that what is... You said Iran as well. Oh, it? oh <laughs> it's good that you said that. So I didn't have to put everything on the table. You see, uh, Iran and Israel were tweeting to each other about who is supporting Bosniaks and who is not supporting Bosniaks. Who is supporting Chovic and who? I mean, the last thing we needed in Bosnia, as Bosnian Muslims, as Bosnians, as Bosniaks, to have Iran protecting us from European Union. And of course, we have the prominent, prominent members of the government on behalf of SDA who were actually saying, see, Iran is with our side. I'm not interested in that. Majority of the people are not interested. So don't make the ground in which Schmidt or OHR ghosts will become reality in which uh, it will be normal to have among Bosniak people in a country to feel that they are betrayed and their, their, their destiny is with Russia and, and Tehran, just for the beginning. I understand, uh, Zlatko, and l let me quickly say that, the again, to every one of these points, and again, fulfilling my role here, you talked about, uh, I was asking you know, how you would uh, resolve this, how, what you think uh, Schmidt should do in, in this situation. But um, you mentioned this point about changing the rules of the game so late. So the, the flip side of that, of course, is that uh, you, Kratz would say, well, that's what's happening with promotion of civic state. This is what they would say. They would say, look, there, there are group rights uh, enshrined in uh, Dayton agreement that in their perspective, again, you know, their view are not being respected. And that's the, that's what's being uh, changed here. So you, again, you have that uh, perspective. And I want to ask you, do you, do you believe this is just simply um, archaic, this concept of constituent peoples and, uh, and should simply be ignored and the, the country should just move towards a civic model? And if so, what about the consent of those civic citizens who don't agree with that? That's, that's my, and that's really, you're the guy to ask this for, uh, uh, to Slotko. So what about that? How do you, you have a model that is not a civic model, uh, and which there are strong adherents to that, particularly among this group that is the, the smallest group, but plus presumably serves as well. So how to how to move what, how to move to this civic model, but uh, without some is consent not required? How how to how to get there? First, I think we have to switch agenda. We are on completely wrong agenda. 
We are on an agenda of election law and trying to fix the things that were not fixed in Washington, in Dayton, later on, and so on, and so on, and so on. You try to fix it by, by, by the ghost proposal, okay? That no one knows what the proposal is, and one day he was a poop, poop, and everyone will be unhappy. No, if the thing goes in that direction, the most happy people will be the ones who are running the country, those four Dalton brothers, okay? They will be the most happy one, but not all of them will say that they're happy, and they will all claim that something is against them, so they can homogenize in additional last month of campaign, they can homogenize their own constituency that we have to be together. So this, this thing was unfair to us. So they will cement, they will cement their, 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 the government they already hold for, hold for four years. That's one thing. Second thing is, it's very important. When I say switch agenda, uh, Edward, you remember when was it? Uh, uh, when you guys walked into the picture and said, okay, Europeans, you feel fix this European agenda, we'll have three armies put them together. You remember that? And then Americans said, okay, we'll, we'll put three armies together. What they did is, they said, that's our business. They worked with us. We had three armies, then two armies, then one army. And today we have armed forces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where people who were literally shooting to each other, not so long time ago, are together going to Afghanistan. Okay, and going to Africa, to different parts, under the UN flag, under NATO protection, as part of NATO units, so going over there. So when you decided to do something along your values and your system of values, you did it, okay? You left to Europeans other things. I'll give you an example. Karen, you know what I'm talking about. Have you heard about two roof, two schools under one roof? Have you heard about it? That's, that's what we have today. We have two schools under one roof. Kids who are Bosniaks and Croats. We are talking about Bosnia and Croat issue, okay? So we have Bosniak kids go to one school and Croats kids go to another school, but they're under the same roof because they have no space. They have only physically one. So there are two schools under one roof for Bosniak kids, for Croat kids, and for the kids who are not Bosniaks or Serbs or, or Croats, they can decide in which out of two schools they can go to, okay? And those kids on a break, they play to each other. They, 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 you know, they have friendships, but they are forced by people who are driving the country, who are running the country. So my question is, if you, Mr. Schmidt, if you want to do something, talk about how to get rid of two schools under one roof. If you want to put Bosnians and Croats closer together, don't give me this election debate 30 days before election campaign. Hit the two schools and the rule. And why I'm saying this to you, uh, Edward, uh, 60 years ago, there was a chief of one canton called the American state, right? I think it's uh, Alabama, Governor Wallace, famously declared in his inaugural speech, segregation now, segregation to, uh, tomorrow, and segregation forever. And what happened? It didn't happen. It was stopped. So we expect you, yes. you guys, you Americans, to help us. Don't, don't, don't make through election law our, not the Governor Vallas, but four governors who want segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. So think about it. Don't go in the wrong. You are good in shared society. You are not good in segregated societies. So don't support anything that will cement that model that was done in Understood. Dayton. It Understood. was to stop the war, but actually to make prosperous peace as well. Zalako, a very good point. And let me just say, as an American uh, who uh, understands the, the, the meaning of those words by segregationists, um, and, and how it would change. Let, let's just remember how it changed. And those Americans here who, who know about the civil rights movement know it wasn't uh, just some top-down uh, high representative type thing. There was a movement, a civil rights movement that was uh, 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 black and white, led of course, above all by Martin Luther King. But there was a movement, people went 
they marched, they went to Alabama. And my question for you, this is this is the thing. It's great to 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 say and to castigate Dayton, and I'm the first one to to know it was a uh, incredibly flawed, an unnecessarily flawed agreement. But Zlatko, I'm asking you again as the leader, where is that movement in Bosnia and Herzegovina with all the international support? What happened to all those grants given by the NED, by Rockefeller Brothers Fund, all of that? Where where is the movement? That why do why do we just see these protests against Schmidt mainly in Sarajevo? Why not even a small protest in Chaplina, in Shiroki Birek, in in Priador, in Bielina? Uh, why just there? Why why is what happened? Why is was there never this movement of people who have a shared interest? Uh, look, leave the ethnic stuff out of it. We don't like corruption. You don't like corruption. We want a clean environment. You want a clean environment. What happened? That would be the foundation for a civic society. And it, it doesn't exist. And, and it's 27, 28 years after the war. And, and you, you don't have that, Zlatko. And I was just in Sarajevo. You know, it, it, it's not there. That basis is not there. So to bring in the, the segregation uh, example from the United States, uh, Americans marched uh, uh, together, arm in arm, to, to, to get uh, legislation for that. Where's that arm in arm movement uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina? But uh, you are right. But let me remind you, you know your history better than I do. And I'm really kind of, I don't want to go in a slippery slope. I mean, but um, uh, yes, you had the movement. It was impressive movement. Today you have those things when uh, Me Too was happening and so on. And that's what America is about. But it was not always hundreds of millions of people were on one side. It didn't, it didn't uh, happen because 120 million people said to George Wallace, you're not right. It required leadership. It required, uh, it required a small group of committed people who believed in some set of values, who had a vision. Because Martin Luther King, or Robert F. Kennedy, they, uh, they did not happen because there were tens and hundreds of millions of people walking on the streets and marching and looking for it. Okay? Because those two uh, young Afro-Americans who walked in Alabama in, in university back 60 years ago, there were just two of them. But there was a National Guard, there was a state, there was a leadership from this very city as well. And then it happened with the millions and millions of people marching together. So yes, there are people in Bosnia and Herzegovina who are in a situation like there were civil society, civil movements, representatives in the 60s in this country. And they are not majority in my country. But don't, don't kill them with hope by one election, technical, uh, you know, changes yes. that are so controversial to everyone. So we have a, you know, you know, Edward, you were so long among us. We have that expression: "Don't kill the, the bull for the one one piece of beef." Okay, That's, I mean, don't don't do that. Don't don't uh, don't Z change. Zlaka, I, I, I totally forgive me for jumping in. We're we're obviously we've gone over time here, Zlaka, and, and I take your point. Um, I, I just you know, because especially we have viewers, we have a lot of interest here, and Bosnia Herzegovina is really at a crucial moment. Let's just remember what Schmidt's challenge is. He says, come up with solutions. So uh, I understand the, 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 the uh, serious implications of cementing the, the, these concerns. But what are, what are the solutions? Who, who, is, who is engaging? That's my question here and, and remains. Who is engaging with those, like we saw, who, who have nothing to do with uh, the vilified leadership of Dragan Chovic, but uh, do not- uh, I'm not are, are, talking about, only about Chovic, I'm talking about all leaders exactly. of big major ethnic parties. Don't, don't, don't you understand that this is strengthening Isabegovic's position? Don't you realize that this is strengthening radicalism but, among segregated forces among Bosniaks as well? Don't you understand that? Of that? course, of course. It's like, no, no, and so, that's, so, that's so very don't clear. Make, don't, don't, Mr. Schmidt, don't make a move in the direction that you will please all three of them. Some of them will be openly happy. Some will say, okay. But uh, his it. appeal, his, his appeal is uh, for people to come with 
uh, even he said this. This was when he had this, you know, uh, strong show of temper yesterday. His his appeal is come with constructive suggestions. That's the thing. And so we're, we're that's that's the challenge. It's it, it, I think the point has been made that these are very problematic. But now the question is what 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 should should we do? How does Bosnia escape from this? And let me while we have let me see if there's any hands. Uh, uh, there, Sinman, please. Uh, uh, and if we have a microphone, I can. Why the microphones? Really, for the ones who you don't know, uh, Schmidt yesterday cracked up. In a, in a, he went ballistic in one uh, press conference in Gorazde. He was so pissed off. I mean, he started yelling. I mean, he was, he, you know, these people are, are running this country. They are scums. I mean, blah, blah, and everything. And he really had like a nervous breakdown almost. He was so tough about the people who are running this country. And I, I understand that. But my comment was very simple. Can you imagine the guy was here a few months and uh, after a few meetings with him, he almost collapsed. He almost gets frenzic. I mean, can you imagine us for 25 plus years dealing with those guys <laughs> and we still uh, think that we are normal? Probably we are not. If we were normal, like Schmidt, we would have cracked up much earlier. So, I mean, the fact that he really uh, cracked is uh, because, I mean, that's our reality and he wasn't used on it. You know, Schwabe is very precise German guy. He just don't believe that, that that people are running the country that he's meeting on a daily basis. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Cinnamon Dornseif, um, I am the director of the Foreign Policy Institute. I'd like to thank you, Ed, for bringing this incredibly interesting discussion to SICE and the Foreign Policy Institute. Mr. Minister, thank you for a very impassioned, um, yet very clear presentation. Um, one of the things that I'd like to suggest as uh, uh, the future would be your vision of a multi-ethnic society resonates very deeply, yet you have described in uh, searing detail the incentives that exist for the three ethnic enclaves. And um, would you give one or two more examples, you've given several already, about places where you see hope to move in that direction. And if there's not time to answer it, I would just say it's a suggestion for the future. And a great suggestion. And Simon, why don't we just quickly collect, uh, uh, sir, uh, this gentleman right here. Thanks. Uh, I have a big question, an important question. And that is what happens when we step back and we embrace self-determination and we actually hold a Wilsonian referendum in the country and Croats do decide to join Croatia and the Republic of Srpska does decide to join uh, Serbia. And why can't we let that referendum happen? This right here. Hi, thanks so much for um, coming here and speaking with us today. It's been a very interesting debate, um, and I look forward to seeing the policy proposals put forward. Uh, my question is, is at the beginning of this um, discussion, you really mentioned the decline of trust in institutions, and that's an issue here in the United States as well. Um, what are some hopes for the future? Um, you mentioned, um, Mr. Jones, you mentioned that there needs to be a groundswell movement of the people, but how can we turn the tide and increase trust in institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Uh, yeah. One second. If it changes, it's good. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And on that, uh, that's a great question. I'm just going to want to segue that because we can't uh, close this event without mentioning this word, and that's corruption. So, um, the uh, uh, which is linked to this, uh, and you know there was this uh, effort in Bosnian Parliament. We had uh, the uh, two members uh, of um, Nasha Stranka here, including Damir Aunat from the State Parliament, who led this effort with Serbs, with his Serb counterparts, to examine and investigate corruption within the judiciary. They, they uh, prepared this 100-page report. It was backed by the U.S. Embassy, international community, EU, OSCE. Uh, is that the avenue, uh, Zlatko? Can we, is, is the, what this gentleman's question is about and, and Cinnamon's question, is the pathway uh, to this uh, uh, by tackling uh, corruption? And, and I note here, you know, again, with the, the names of these vilified figures, and we should mention 
here, uh, not just Dragan Chovich, the name, but also Bakir Izabegovich, is held in uh, very low esteem by uh, uh, Krat, uh, who perceive him to be a, a Bosniak nationalist. So uh, we have uh, you know, a, a mutual sense of, uh, of enmity uh, there. And, and we know uh, here, I would just add that uh, there, there's this internal movement of reform within the country, but the US has acted unilaterally, this administration, the Biden and the previous, to sanction, in, uh, apply sanctions on individuals, uh, both who obstruct the Dayton Agreement and for corruption. And uh, Milorad Dodik is only one. There are Kroats and Bosniaks as well who've been sanctioned. Should the US, here, you, you can, you can uh, tackle this uh, very quickly. The US could, could sanction uh, some of these uh, prominent individuals. So please, Zarko. Well, with the, I mean, it's good that you mentioned Bakir Izabegovic because I mentioned it a few times as a guilty one as well. So it's good that I'm not the only one who was mentioning him, right? So, so I put very clear uh, perspective on what I think about uh, this policy that uh, Mr. Izabegovic is uh, running. And I'm saying that uh, him and uh, Chovic and Dodik, they already have a deal, to be very precise. And I know that there will be a lot of questions about it later on. But yes, they do plan how to form a government together, and they need this as a pretext for having campaign on these issues so they will win elections. So, I mean, that's what I'm complaining about, Schmidt being actually doing their free campaign for them by doing this mess. And that's, an, uh, that's, that's, that's a good point. To, now, uh, I was a leader of opposition, and I tried to put that through as a, when we put the coalition, something which we call law on illegal, uh, seizing the legal assets. It was very simple. We didn't make it. We couldn't make it through. It was very simple. It's not about how much money do you do have and how wealthy you are, but it's you have to prove, basically speaking, that you pay the taxes for it. It's very simple. There are, there are laws like that in a lot of European countries that, and we tried to push it through. It didn't work because we did not have sufficient majority. I tried to do it as opposition leader. I tried to do it, and maybe I made my mistake. I said that leaders of political parties who are in the parliament, from me on, should be the one who should be first questioned according to that law. And I made a mistake probably because then some other people who together have majority, they were not happy to be first one and investigated on it. So that's maybe my mistake, what I did. But now, as a part of this, uh, yes, there is, a, there is there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are looking for some kind of alternative uh, to, to, to the parties that are running them for right now. Right now, for example, there is one interesting movement that I'm involved in, which I'm not on any lists, I'm not candidate for anything, but I'm on practically with the people who were together disappointed and disillusioned about the strength of civil society parties. And there were a lot of people used to be with Komšić, with SDP and so on. Because just to give you an example, uh, those two parties in 2010 and 2014 had about 300,000 votes. In last two years ago and four years ago, those parties have 150,000 votes. There are more than half of their voters who were just disillusioned and were disillusioned with everyone. So we put together one very interesting experiment in which uh, those two parties, Social Democrats and the Green Party, Green Movement, they made it together as a two parties, a platform, a list with a very precise program. And they are looking for everyone. Let's talk about the program. They put the lists for elections in which more than 50% of the people on their list are not members of any of those parties. Because we think that that's the way to move the people. I don't think that they will make landslide victory, but they will do something. Let's have the people like that, let's give them a chance. Don't kill them with, with election changes of elections law. I mean, when we put together more than 50% of people, two parties lists who are uh, free uh, business people, who are painters, actors, academics, and so on, who simply don't want to be in any party. But in order to be in, in elections, you have to be registered for elections, and parties are registered for elections. But those parties gave their platform for the people. That's, is that, the, are they going to make something big? I hope they'll make something which will make them showing that there is a seed over there. 
like 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 movements in the 60s in here. They will be promoting something which will be talking about human rights, they are talking about economy, they are talking about green transformation, they are talking about climate change, they are talking about changes of education, they are talking about education for human rights, not only education how to make living, but how to live. These are people who are trying to do that. Is that enough for these elections? No, but don't kill them now with some, uh, let's say, stupid changes to please Izet Begovic, let me precise, Izet Begovic, he will say that I'm not right. I'm not saying yes, but he is in a deal with Trovich. And they'll make tomorrow, they're looking for the partners, how they will make uh, government again. So it's very, very simple. Now, to having going back to, to the question, I'm sorry, about referendum. It's very simple. Can you have a referendum that uh, New Mexico have a referendum to join the Mexico? Probably not, because it's not constitutional. Uh, uh, in according to a Dayton Peace Accord, and our constitution, which is part of the peace accord, it's illegitimate to have a referendum, but the referendum that is defined by the Bosnia and Herzegovina parliament that applies to overall country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's very simple. It is part of Dayton Peace Accord. It's part of our constitution that uh, Bosniaks, Serbs, or Croats cannot have referendum, which is asking Bosniaks or Serbs or Croats in certain parts of the country, do you want to take away part of the country with you someplace else? It's not going to happen. And if that happens, we will be in a completely different, different. And, and a last point, I think that, uh, yes, I, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very important as, as, as you, and I will very gladly talk to Edward about that. We put some paper about it based on what your suggestions and see what is the perspective, Edward, how to go, how to move from this, this, uh, ethnophobic, ethnocentric democracy, which I don't call democracy, but ethnocracy or call it however you want to, to the next level of the game. Let's learn something from 60s in this country and hope that we will have that somehow in the future. And that's exactly right. And as Cinnamon, uh, as Director Dornsight, to your question, that's exactly what's missing here. There's, there's uh, wholesale demonization here is what's going on. And, and this is what uh, is, is such a concern, this between Croton and Bozak, and I started here and I began with a very positive example of Birchko and the role, the crucial role that Croats played there. Without that Croat voice, uh, it would have been perceived as simply a zero-sum territorial uh, dispute between uh, uh, Bosniaks and Serbs. And it was Croats who injected the, the crucial element that this is about democratic coexistence. Uh, and, and what we have now is a, a breakdown, total breakdown, total vilification, demonization. And what I said, Zlako, there's no engagement. There's no engagement with uh, the other side. It's all about Dragan Chovic. There's no uh, consultation. There, there's no discussion of, of, with people, like I said, who are opponents, who, uh, Croats, who, uh, who can't stand that. And and uh, how does they but yet uh, support Schmidt and actually think it's minimal what what he's done and that that engagement agree or disagree that's a civic state there's no civic state without civic discourse and uh, and to simply sort of uh, wipe away uh, these uh, whole groups because the leader is. Uh, perceived corrupt and criminal and has in his agenda uh, is there. And just quickly to reinforce the answer to the question, there's another question from the U.S. perspective. We cannot tolerate uh, as uh, Americans uh, the uh, this uh, partition uh, division and uh, Serbs go their own way and Croats uh, uh, take uh, Herzeg Bosna. As Americans, uh, this is unacceptable. We brokered the Dayton Agreement. The Dayton Agreement was premised on return of uh, displaced and refugees to their homes. Uh, that didn't happen in Republika Srpska in particular. And, uh, and uh, uh, therefore, it's uh, null and void. The notion that, oh, well, gee, we, we can secede now after having, um, again, documented by the International Court that genocide took place of Bosniaks. And I should add, the brutal, violent expulsion of Croats from Republika Srpska. Uh, th so there's no just, oh, well, we don't feel like living here anymore. We'll be on our own. Uh, that's uh, unacceptable from an American standpoint as uh, the, the guarantor and the, the author of the very uh, convoluted uh, Dayton Agreement. 
Um, so uh, with that, uh, Zlatko, I, I, I thank you. I just, I can't close the event without asking this one thing, because we mentioned your role as foreign minister and grassroots geopolitics. We also started with Russia. What happens if Russia vetoes the extension of the U4 mandate? This is coming up in the UN Security Council. Those of you who don't know think this is all just intramural stuff between squabbling peoples in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. You watch in November, there's a very serious case. Some people say they won't because they're afraid NATO will come in. And actually the Dodik uh, uh, doesn't want uh, the U4 mandate to be uh, not extended because they're afraid NATO, do you, do, what do you think Russia will do? And do you believe that NATO does uh, have the, the authority to enter if the Russians, uh, probably the Chinese, possibly the Chinese as well, veto the extension of the U4? U4 is the uh, EU peacekeeping force that took over from NATO, but that is supported by NATO. You, you pointed out a very important question. Uh, Dodik, last time when he was with Putin in St. Petersburg, he publicly asked him and he broadcasted what he asked Putin. He asked Putin not to veto presence of EU4, not to veto, because Dodik knows as well as Putin, and Putin will probably listen to him and say, okay, we will be nice to Europeans, we won't veto them. You know why? Because they know the NATO will come. So it's very simple because there is a mandate, OHR has a mandate according to the peace accord to actually ask uh, power to prevent the violation of peace, which is NATO like it was back in 95. So it's very simple. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't care are they going to do it or not because uh, whatever they do, there's uh, ultimate power of high rep and uh, you guys to do something if the peace accord gets violated and not to, to answer just it's very important Please. one uh, uh, about corruption i was uh, that group of people that i was talking about this social democrats and green movement part of their seven min, seven points program is fight against corruption and one of the things is that first session of the parliament they ask bosnian parliament and presidency to join the uh, initiative that was made by 42 former heads of states and governments, about 32 plus Nobel laureates, together with about over 150 dignitaries from all over the world, which is called for formation of international anti-corruption court. An American judge from here from Ireland, his, his name is Mark Wolf, together with Richard Goldstone, because you know who Goldstone is, because one of your, you were one of the key persons with your testimony in Hague Tribunal, who actually, thanks to the people like you, we get verdicts in Hague that are based on the truth about the war crimes, including genocide in Srebrenica. So the Goldstone is the guy who was uh, chief prosecutor of uh, for, former uh, court for former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and two of them initiated formation of the International Anti-Corruption Court, because there's 189 countries in the world who, uh, who joined UN declaration that is talking about it, but no one is doing about it because it is left to state courts all over the world to fight corruption. And this court is initiative that Canada and Netherlands already took that initiative to be a global initiative. We have some countries like, uh, like Northern Macedonia, with the new president who joined that initiative. And I think that Bosnia and Herzegovina should be the first one among the leaders to show after elections, yes, we are serious about this, to join that initiative. And I know very much about that initiative because I'm among the former heads of states and government who signed that and promoting that, that we established the International Anti-Corruption Court that will be above the state legislative, just like European Convention on Human Rights and Freedoms is above our, our laws. And we have to think about how to make it alive. And uh, in that sense, I think it is very important. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, I was uh, in Srebrenica a year ago, uh, initiated Srebrenica Leadership Initiative. We, we initiated a group of 40, 50 of us, formed an initiative that is dealing with the memory of Srebrenica and spreading that uh, word uh, following American Congress that adopted resolutions, Srebrenica, European Parliament that adopted resolutions, Srebrenica, some prominent people from who you know, you know from the region, uh, President Josipovic, Prime Minister Kosor, Jarko Korac, 
the Deputy Prime Minister of late Zoran Džinđić government, Natasha Kandić, Filip Ujanović, Branko Crvenkovski, together with people from Europe, together with, uh, with Kerry Kennedy, the president of Robert F. Kennedy Foundation, and some of our American friends, uh, Ambassador uh, Susan Elliott, she was in Dayton as well, running National Committee for American Policy. We initiated a Srebrenica Leadership Initiative that we want to make that s s initiative as something which is based on our memory of what was happening, that things like that never happen again. But when I was, and that's my message when I was using the, that, uh, that initiative, I said at that time, what we need in Bosnia and Herzegovina is not hatred, what we need in Bosnia and Herzegovina is not violence and lawlessness, uh, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another uh, and feeling of justice towards those who still suffer within our country, whether it be Christians or whether they be Muslims. We can do will in this country. We will have difficult times. We will have diff we had difficult times in the past. We will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of the violence. It is not the end of lawlessness, but it is not the end of disorder. And we have to do something with it. This is quote for Robert F. Kennedy. He just didn't say Muslims and Christians. He said black and white, right? So we're on the same page, but you went through it. And, and the, basically speaking, we have a lot of way to go. So, it's a lot of uh, Edward, be with us. Yes. Don't be with those yes. guys who are actually trying to divide people because of their beliefs. That's right. Or because of their identities and whatever. Thank, uh, Zlatko, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And thank you for that moving uh, quotation from Robert F. Kennedy. And, and those of you who say, ah, those are, he's just quoting, and those are just words. I was in Zlatko's office in Sarajevo just last month, uh, meeting, I won't mention the name, but a very prominent leader from one of the uh, non-Bosniak uh, community, uh, constituent peoples, uh, they are quite prominent figure. We we had an excellent conversation in your office. You clear you have uh, openness and rapport uh, there around the country. And our goal here, Zlaka, was I believe was achieved. We wanted to shed some light, not just heat, but light on these very controversial, contentious issues, and open a way for civic discourse and engagement on what are actually uh, quite difficult issues. And uh, we hope uh, with Director Dornstein, with your support, that we will indeed continue on this way here at FBI to try to uh, uh, be a platform for uh, uh, dialogue and, and illumination of these views and not just uh, demonization and, and vilification, because there's no way for uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina in, in that way. So Zlatko, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Zlatko Lugunja.